everyone. Welcome to History on Trial. This is Dr. Tracy McCarthy, psychologist, attorney, and educator. We're going to be looking at Atlantis. We're going to be looking at a source from the 1800s that discusses the phenotype makeup of the various people that were quote unquote found in the Americas. And there's a discussion in the book. They use this sort of rhetorical analysis um, to discuss this issue. But there's a discussion in the book about the uh, comparisons between those who were found in America and those who were found in Africa and some similarities between the two. And also it uh, addresses a number of issues about assumptions that have been made about the diversity of people that were found in America. And so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some of the uh, commentaries about some of the cultural dynamics also. So we're just going to go through the resource rather quickly, but you're going to get a sense of the questions that are asked. And the questions are very important because the questions are the things that provoke thought with respect to this particular source. And just a reminder, these are some of the phenotypes of individuals representing South Africa that also resemble the phenotypes that are in the Americas. And this is just another reminder of the discussion we had related to kinesthetic intelligence that appears to be similar on both sides of the Atlantic. And from that previous discussion, another depiction of the dynamic of kinesthetic intelligence. And we're going to start off with this source, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, and this is from 1882. So this is a fairly old source that we're going to be looking at. Now this source makes some very bold claims that contrast with claims that have been made by other historians over time related to the Americas. One bold claim is that uh, the Americas were comprised of red, white, black, and yellow men. And these individuals united to form the original population of the Americas. Another assertion made by this historian is that the entire population of Europe and the south shore of the Mediterranean is a mongrel race uh, comprised of individuals who were originally dark brown or a red race with a white race. Now remember, uh, in terms of understanding race, race is understood genetically in terms of family. However, this individual is using phenotype to also um, describe this construct of race. And the author goes into the question of complexion. And again, this is a very rhetorical analysis. And so the author goes through a series of rhetorical questions uh, addressing this issue. And so one thing that the author points out is that there have been found in the Americas early on uh, races that range from what would be described as the white races, very light people, um, and also tribes of black or very dark hue. And so, of course, this contrasts with the original story that people have heard that everyone in the Americas uh, looked like, quote unquote, red man. And so here you see this assertion that there was this diversity in terms of the color spectrum. And because of this, the author also indicates a belief that there was significant travel between Africa and America and the quote unquote red men and the black men and the white men across this space. Now, of course, this is based upon this idea of Atlantis. Now, when people generally talk about Atlantis, there's often this idea of Atlantis being something that's sunk into the sea. But if the cartographers are being accurate in their depictions, and they may or may not be accurate, um, what you have is something that looks like America is actually Atlantis. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to imagine that there's another piece of land that was there that fit 
the way that America would fit up against Europe and Africa. And so, again, if the depictions are correct, then it suggests completely that America is what would be considered Atlantis. And so it's also suggesting that there is a break that was noted in the land space and then that was filled with water which would be the Atlantic Ocean at one point um, the southern half was known as the Ethiopian Ocean and so it would be interesting to know if uh, Ethiopia was considered what was on the southern half of the uh, west coast and also the southern half of what was on that eastern side which would have been Africa The author makes some very bold claims also referring to a Smithsonian report and indicates that there is a belief based upon phenotype and a number of other issues that the individuals who were found on the west side of the Atlantic were very similar to or related to individuals in Africa such as the Tariqs, the Copts, and the Moors. One of the things noted is that the uh, skull, shape of the skull, uh, was similar in terms of artifacts that they found in Africa and in the Americas. And also there were populations that were described as being reddish brown. And that reddish brown would be that copper color that you hear people refer to um, in both Africa and also, of course, the Americas, because that was, of course, what was used to describe um, Americans. What's also noteworthy is this indication of identifying that collective uh, as the Egyptians of the Atlantic. Now, of course, this also coincides with some of the historical narrative of both Ireland and Scotland. Now the author here is going on to discuss this connection between early Egyptians and Atlantis. And one of the things that the author points out is that the Egyptians apparently depicted themselves as red men on their own monuments. And then you also have this um, dynamic where representations of individuals who are considered Negroes are on monuments in Central America. And here the author also discusses this issue of idols found in the Americas with what are considered strikingly Negroid faces. Let's take a second here and just talk about the, this OID, O-I-D, at the end of um, certain words. That indicates a likeness. And so you have the word Negro and then you have the word Negroid. And so in some instances, you might have someone who is considered true Negro, whatever that is, based upon whoever is using that term. And then you have other individuals who might be described as Negroid, meaning very similar to in terms of phenotype. The same thing occurs when you see the ending ish, I-S-H. It means similar to uh, likeness of um, indicating that there is some distinction between the original and then the ish. And here you can see some of the depictions of these quote unquote Negro idols that were found in Central America. Now, of course, these are coming from the 1800s, um, but you can clearly see from the facial features uh, you see the broader features, the more full features, and based upon this depiction, you see the skin color being darker also. And here we see some additional depictions, and the depictions also look slightly what you would consider stereotypically now Asiatic, and the depiction in the upper right hand corner also does look very similar to some of the depictions that you might have seen representing individuals from ancient Egypt. Here the author provides another depiction of what is identified as a Negro head in Vera Cruz. On the right hand side you see a discussion about culture 
And what is indicated here is that they found uh, both black and white men in the Americas together, living in peace together and speaking one language. Speaking one language suggests that there was a shared culture. Either they were the same people, but of different hues, or they merged at some point in time. And you also see a discussion about the familiarity that the people in the Americas appear to have with each other, whether they were identified as red or black or white, and then asking the question, why would the red men of a certain part of the Americas know about the black and the white members in another part of the Americas? And so there is this suggestion based upon the observations of those who were coming to colonize. Um, there is the suggestion that there was significant diversity already going on in the Americas. And so that would explain all of the different phenotypes that you see even now when you talk about the different American Indian groups. Here the author provides another depiction of an individual who is described as having a face that is strongly Ethiopian. There's also a notation that there were a number of artifacts that would suggest that the individuals had Negroid or Negro features. The author makes an interesting leap after that though and starts talking about the Negroes never being a seagoing race and suggesting that perhaps the existence of the darker people on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, that that might be related to a slave trade even earlier on in antiquity. The author does not offer anything really, however, to support this assertion that the darker skinned people were in the Americas because of an even earlier slave trade. And here the author references another source and there's an indication here that in Chichen Itza there were tall figures of people with small heads, thick lips, and curly short hair or wool and these individuals were regarded as Negroes. And here the author is referencing the piece Human Species to support the idea that black populations were found in the Americas and they were in isolated tribes in the midst of very different populations, again, suggesting this diversity dynamic with people of different phenotypes in the Americas, from the copper colored to the quote unquote black to the quote unquote white. And so these black tribes were found in Brazil, St. Vincent in the Gulf of Mexico, the Jamasi, uh, we can assume that that's the Yamasi of Florida, and then also the dark complexion Californians. And the author also notes that Balboa indicated um, seeing people who were described as Negroes in 1513 in the Isthmus of Darien. Okay, now we have the author asserting that the historic barbarians are the navigators and pirates also known as the Caries or the Carians, and that these individuals actually antedated the Phoenicians. Not only that, the author is indicating a belief that these are the same people as the Caribs of the West Indies, the Caras of the Honduras. And so they are suggesting that those people who were considered uh, of the Barbary coast and the barbarians, that those individuals are pretty much the same people as the ones that were found in the Americas. And here the author looks at the source North Americans of Antiquity and indicates that there was a notation that white Indians were found along the Lake Michigan area around Green Bay. Now these quote unquote white Indians, uh, also known as white mulattoes, were identified by Jesuit missionaries. Now the Jesuits have a very interesting history with the American Indians. And it is noteworthy that often where the Jesuit missionaries appeared, the Indians disappeared. 
And so there's always the question then, is it possible that there was an identity appropriation going on? Um, is it possible that there was an annihilation of a group and then another group taking on that identity? Because you do have this automatic replacement dynamic going on in some places or in, in close proximity in terms of time. And so you also have an indication that in uh, the Kansas area, you had the dark skinned cause and you had groups of people who were black as Negroes. This author continues this discussion of diversity, quoting Winchell, and it was indicated the ancient Indians of California in the latitude of 42 degrees were as black as the Negroes of Guinea. And then there's an indication that the tribes in Mexico were of an olive or reddish complexion, relatively light. There were among some of the black races of the tropical regions, individuals who were very light colored and these tribes were interspersed and that these individuals had light hair and blue eyes. They noted that there's a similarity between this dynamic and the Tarig of the Sahara and the Afghans of India. The author goes on to discuss this dynamic of diversity in both Africa and the Americas by using the Fulani as the example. The Fulani are of West and Central Africa. That's not the origin of the Fulani, but that's where they were located at this time. And they were also in Negro land. And so the Fulani were described as being reddish black in color then and even now. And the interesting notation is that the Fulani, with all of the diversity that they have in terms of phenotype, um, that they are are noted as having a tradition of having ancestors who were identified as white. And here you have another interesting depiction where the author shows the different phenotypes of groups of men. And so one group is red, one group yellow, one group black, and one group white. And the author also notes that this is how people were divided in India in terms of the four castes, that these castes were divided based upon color in many instances. And so there's another notation that goes back to a previous discussion where the red men of India were the Kshatriyas and they were considered the warrior caste. And that's also the group known as the Maria. And so this is further tying India to the Americas and also the Maria or the Mari people to the Americas and also to Africa. And from this 1881 piece, the author offers this observation related to the folklore of Negroes on the plantations in the South in terms of the United States and the myths and stories of certain tribes of Indians in South America. And so there's the question of how could these groups in South America and then on the plantations in the Southern United States, how could they have these same folklores um, these same belief systems, these myths and these stories, if they were not in some way related. And here the author makes the boldest claim. The author indicates a belief that modern civilization is Atlantean, meaning basically American. And so the author indicates that without the thousands of years of development, which were already in Atlantis, modern civilization could not have existed. And so there is a belief that all of the invention of the present age is based upon the foundational work that was left by Atlantis thousands of years ago. And again, we are basically talking about America. Common sense would tell anyone that that's what is being indicated if the cartographers are correct in their depictions of the coast of West Africa and the coast of the Eastern United States and the Americas and also that Western coast of Europe where the Isles are. And here this author goes on to make an even bolder claim that the quote unquote Semitic race originated in the Americas. And this is by extension because they are indicating here, how are we to explain the existence of the Semitic race in Europe without Atlantis? 
uh, the Semitic race is described as an intrusive one, a race of colonizers on seacoast. And then there is the ultimate question of where are the old world affinities of the Semitic race? And so where are the origins of the Semitic race, the uh, evidence of the Semitic race originating in the old world or in the East? And as we wrap this up, we have looked at this interesting source from the 1800s, which discusses the similarities in phenotypes across the water and also these artifacts that have been found that suggest that people who were very much related were occupying both sides of the Atlantic. And you also have an indication that there is significantly more diversity uh, that was found in the Americas than previously noted and also significantly more diversity on the west coast of Africa in particular than previously noted. This author also went on to indicate that the individuals who are currently in Europe are comprised of a mongrel race made up of all of the different people that were indicated uh, found in the Americas and also in Africa. While it's wonderful to find out all of this history and hear all of these different theories about historical realities, what is interesting is how individuals at different points in time actually destroy history or start rewriting history. Now it's unclear why it's so difficult to always find accurate artifacts, accurate renditions, accurate narratives in terms of history. But what is going on right now with the iconoclasm and the destruction of the statues and destruction of artifacts by individuals who claim to be well-meaning, this might actually explain why history has been rewritten so many times because you actually see history being rewritten right now where individuals are attempting to destroy any and all evidence of a history of uh, transatlantic slave trading, a history of Jim Crow. Um, and so these depictions are purportedly done in the name of racial and social justice. However, the end result is just the opposite of that. And as you are remembering that knowledge is power, remember that those who forget history are doomed to repeat it.